Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me for this episode is my wife and this week's guest host, Carol Brown. Say hello, Carol. Hello. How are you guys? They can't answer you. I know, but I feel like they would. They probably would. They're They're... just talking to me in their car. I'm good, Carol. How are you? I'm just (laughs) on my way to work. There you go. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Thanks to Krista from the podcast 36 times for reading our disclaimer this week and last. You can find Lily and Krista, our friends from Nova Scotia, and their podcast at 36times.podbean.com. I'm going to totally name drop. Uh, We met them and we had dinner with them with Lily and Krista last summer. They were very nice people. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Lily. And I think they continue to be very nice people. I'm going to say, say I'm going to just assume they are. There you go. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. And Scott would go om nom nom. Oh, nom 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 nom. There you go. Mmm, delicious. This is episode 73. A reminder for those of you planning on going to CrimeCon, but have yet to buy tickets. If you want 10% off your ticket, use our code POUTINE19, that's the word POUTINE, and the numbers 1 and 9, at checkout when buying your tickets at CrimeCon.com. We will see you there in just over a month now. So lucky. I'll be holding the fort down here, but yeah, Mike and Scott will be there with bells on. We will. So you can. Some people have used that coupon too. Some people have been using it, and we really appreciate it. So Scott and I will uh, probably be asked back next year. Yay! Well done. Thanks, guys. Hooray! We have another giveaway from true crime author Alan R. Warren. This week, he wants to give copies of his book Last Man Standing, but. He wants to give them to people who've already received a book from him. Now, just bear with us. To win a copy of Alan's book, Last Man Standing, this week, you have to have already won a book in previous weeks. The first dozen previous winners to email Alan at radiocub, that's cub with two b's, at gmail.com, with a screenshot or link to a goodreads.com or Amazon review that you have done of the book that he sent you, you will get a copy via Kindle in the U.S. or a physical copy in Canada of this week's book, Last Man Standing. This week, you'll be able to hear me on House of Mystery, Alan's Something Weird Media show, on numerous NBC News affiliates across the United States. You might hear me even more than once. Oh my God, he lucky. Wants, he wants me to co-host with him, so there nice. you go. Nice, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Alan. <laughs> On with the show. In this episode, we're off to Prince Edward Island. Dreamy, I love PEI. So do I. From the Canadian Encyclopedia, Prince Edward Island is Canada's smallest province making up just 0.1% of Canada's total land area. It's situated in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and separated from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick by the Northumberland Strait. PEI was known to its earliest settlers, the Mi'kmaq, as abiguate, meaning cradle in the waves, and was described by Jacques Cartier in 1534 as the fairest land that may possibly be seen. PEI's deep red soil has always been its most striking feature, and together with the sea 
the mainstay of the population since the early 18th century. 1534. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. I saw the same red soil that he saw. It's it's beautiful. It, uh, so cool. PEI is home to just over 150,000 residents, and farming is the main industry on the island, providing a whopping 25% of all of Canada's potatoes. They also love their lawns. Everyone seemed to have a, a one of those riding lawnmowers. Yes. Huge. Everybody, when we were there last summer, it's like, wow, everybody's got these riding lawnmowers. The island was only accessible by boat or ferry until 1997, when the 13-kilometer Confederation Bridge opened, connecting PEI with the mainland in New Brunswick. We have traveled across that bridge. Mm -hmm. It's beauty, pleasant summer climate, rich history, cultural offerings, and the friendly islanders make PEI a popular tourist getaway spot. The best. We spent our honeymoon there in 1998. And last summer we stayed in a tiny cabin, like a tiny house, yeah. right near the sea. It was Very awesome. near the ocean. We could hear the waves coming in. It was very nice to uh, fall asleep just hearing the ocean. It was yeah, amazing. It was awesome. Needless to say that major crimes, especially murder, are very rare on the island. And they always shake the islanders up when these occur. On October 7, 1994, RCMP got a call about an abandoned 1982 Buick Regal in a field belonging to a local resident on Highway 169 near Tyne Valley, Prince Edward Island. The area was sparsely populated and it was later learned that the car had been sitting there for days. The vehicle had been parked on a private road hundreds of meters away and out of the sight of the main roads. One thing responding RCMP noted quickly is that the license plates had been removed from the car. Someone had not only taken the time to hide the car, but removing the plates sent up red flags. Yeah, once the plates are gone or when the plates get mixed up, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So the police in this case had to use the vehicle identification number or the VIN, which was still with the car, to determine who it belonged to. Yep. Yeah. And so in 1994, it wasn't as easy as calling up the motor vehicles branch and asking who owns this. So it might have taken a little doing. Yeah. Because the computers weren't so great then. No, some old DOS system that they had to search. Uh, who knows? Yeah. After the database search, a hit came back. The car belonged to a 32-year-old woman named Shirley Ann Duguay from nearby Richmond, roughly a 10-minute drive away from where they'd found the car. Police began trying to reach Shirley by phone, but she was not answering, nor did she return any calls after a number of messages were left by officers. The decision was made to go to Shirley's home to see if everything was okay. Obviously, if you find somebody's car in the woods with no license plates on it, and she's not answering her phone, that's probably the first thing you should do as a cop, don't you think? Yeah. Well, it's a small town, so people would know. But yeah, if cops are going to go to your house, then they're concerned for sure. When RCMP arrived, they met Shirley's father and Shirley's friend Linda there. They told investigators that Shirley, a mother of five, had left in her car to go do errands four days prior and had not returned. Uh, what? When police asked why Shirley had not been reported missing, Shirley's father told them that the family was fearful that Shirley's ex-common-law husband, Douglas Beamish, would swoop in and take Shirley's three youngest kids, who he had fathered. They were hoping that Shirley, who'd been struggling to make ends meet on welfare, was just with friends and taking a, uh, taking a much-needed break. So she left her kids with them? Yes. And then went to do errands? She'd done this before. Okay. But they were starting to worry. Yeah. Shirley had been trying to extricate herself from the 12-year relationship that she'd had with this Beamish guy. Shirley was caught in the age-old cycle of domestic abuse and brief reconciliation after Douglas came crawling back. But after only a few short weeks, the violence would ramp up again, leading to another brutal attack and Shirley leaving, kids in tow. Shirley's family had begged her to stay away from Beamish, but he kept worming his way back into her life. Shirley, her kids, and Beamish were all living in Toronto when in 1991, Shirley sought and was provided a peace bond against Beamish. She fled with the children back to PEI, her home, 
Beamish, finding she'd gone back east, soon followed. This is not good. This is not good. He'd been badgering Shirley ever since. Now that Shirley had a new boyfriend, a local fisherman, Beamish was acting, acting even Beamish was acting even angrier. Yeah. Shirley was afraid to stay at home alone when her folks who lived nearby were out of town. This is why her friend Linda had been there on the weekend of Shirley's disappearance. Linda told police that she'd been staying over at Shirley's place when Doug Beamish had showed up in the days before Shirley disappeared. Doug was in a rage. He and Shirley had a screaming match about their relationship and Shirley stood her ground. Shirley did not want him back. Frustrated and loudly shouting at Shirley, Doug got back into his truck and sped off. Yeah, they never stay away, do they? Linda was asleep when Shirley told the kids she was going out on the morning of October 3rd, and they had not seen her since. Okay, she's trying to get away from him, and he won't leave her alone. No. So now her car is hidden with no plates. Something's no one knows where she is. Yeah, and he was angry the last time he saw her. This is not good. Shirley's family was very worried, more so now that her car had been found. Shirley was not with her boyfriend, and none of her other friends, family, or anyone else claimed to have seen her since she'd gone out for what she said would be a couple of hours. Yeah. Where was Shirley? I mean, PEI is not a very big place. No, and I feel like a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of people there, but it's small enough to know that people know of the other people, like where she would be. Mm-hmm. Someone would have seen her. Yeah. She might have been driving to Summerside, which is a city, but somebody there would have seen her. Yeah, and she has friends, I'm sure. Yeah. And if she's going to for a getaway, maybe she was going to be going with her friends somewhere. Suspicion rightly fell on Douglas Beamish right away. Beamish was living with his parents since a recent stint in prison for other offenses. We're already seeing that Douglas Beamish is not of great character. This is just the danger zone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Police visited Doug Beamish, who was claiming he had no idea where Shirley was. Doug admitted that he and Shirley had fought often, but claimed things were calming between them. Very convenient. Yeah. Beamish told the cops that the last time he'd seen Shirley, a little less than a week before, she'd driven him to work as he was having trouble with his truck. Why? Weren't they mad at each other? Well, he was the father of three of her youngest kids, and apparently they were in this push-pull relationship all the time. So and there this was, was a time, like a kind of a calm period there, there where were, she was dropping him off at work. Yeah, and this is what he's claiming. We haven't been able to substantiate that. Doug told police that the last time he'd seen Shirley is when she'd dropped him off, and that the conversation had been calm and friendly the whole time. Beamish also told police he felt something was bothering Shirley, and that if she'd gone somewhere, it might have been to see her friends in Toronto. Convenient. The seasoned officers sensed that Doug Beamish was not being truthful, but there was no hard evidence to prove that yet. If she had actually driven off the island, they would have been able to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, they have records of her either taking that ferry. Yeah, it, it, there was no bridge Yeah, there was no bridge at the time, then, right? But so, they would know. Definitely someone would have seen her on the ferry. Yep. She would have been seen at the ferry. She would have been seen at an airport if she had taken a plane from Charlottetown. I'm thinking if she was in Toronto, she would have called her parents and said, I, the kids were with you. Sorry, I just got carried away. Went to Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, at the time there were buses too that went to Toronto, but like you say, somebody would have seen her getting on a bus too. Shirley's car was impounded as a potential crime scene. A search of the area near where the car had been found did not turn up any signs of what might have happened to Shirley. As a search party was put together, the police forensics team began the meticulous task of scouring Shirley's Buick for clues about her disappearance. Right away, they found disturbing signs that something awful had happened in that car. There were small spatters that looked like bloodstains on the windshield and throughout the interior of the vehicle. Many, larger brownish-red stains were soaked into the passenger seat. Initial testing indicated it was blood and that it was human, but whose blood was it? The specimens were sent off to Halifax for testing, 
along with samples from Shirley's children and other close relatives to compare. So they did what's called reverse paternity. They took her father's DNA and then her children's DNA and they find in the middle. Right. Yeah. That's how they did the DNA evidence. So it was 1994. Okay. This would be holdback evidence, but the RCMP knew that they had to act quickly before evidence was covered by snow during the fast approaching harsh PEI winter. Hopefully, Shirley was alive, but the amounts of blood in the car did not give police much hope. Ugh, so grim. Shirley's name and photo were all over the news. Due to the rarity of such an event, this was a big deal in the area. Rumors about what might have happened to Shirley and who done it burned across the province like a brush fire. I can only imagine, because just from what I've seen there, it's just such a small town that that would be just horrible for that whole town. Everybody knows everybody there, pretty much literally, just like our Newfoundland episode that we just had. Police and searchers began to run down every tip that came in. Over the next week, local law enforcement trained search dogs, friends and family searching for Shirley Dugate were joined by 60 cadets from PEI's police academy. It's called Holland College. Hmm. As long as the light permitted, the searchers knocked on doors, searched near Shirley's home, close to where the car had been found, combed through wooded areas, and carefully explored fields, parks, backyards, and the shoreline. A helicopter searched from the air. So they were pretty serious about finding something. Yeah, they needed to find something, because it's so strange someone would just vanish. Especially, like I say, in such a small place. Yeah. It's a very similar story to the Samantha Walsh story. They even used psychics and hypnotized some potential witnesses with the hope that they'd be able to uncover the story of what happened to Shirley. So, essentially, people who would say, I saw Shirley, or somebody who looked like Shirley, would be put under hypnosis to see if they could bring up any more details. I kind of hoped at one point that that, was, that would actually work, but I think from all the stuff that I've seen, that doesn't really work. One psychic said that Shirley DeGay would be found near water and pine trees in a shallow grave. The island was covered in pine trees, and you're never more than five-minute drive away from water on PEI. It wasn't much to go on. In the woods, about half a kilometer from, sh from the place Shirley's car had been found, Cops came across a pillow with what appeared to be blood stains on it. Shirley used a pillow while driving to better see over the steering wheel as she was only four foot nine inches tall and weighed less than a hundred pounds. Oh, she was just tiny. Just a tiny little person, yes. Nearby, they found a t-shirt, also covering what turned out to be blood. And finally, close to the shirt, a shovel. Two black hairs found on the shovel were compared to those taken from Shirley's hairbrush. Sure enough, they were a match. Although telling, this would also be holdback evidence. Ugh, this is super grim. RCMP investigators were more concerned than ever that Shirley had been murdered and buried somewhere in the area. Cadaver dogs and cops looked for signs of a grave, but they came up empty. After three weeks of searching with no other clues, islanders were horrified. Was it possible this mother of five children would simply vanish without a trace? No. No. According to the book Tears of a Cheetah by Dr. Stephen J. O'Brien, it was then that 150 soldiers from the Canadian forces were tasked to assist in the search for Shirley DeGay. Acting on a tip from a woman who'd seen a couple arguing near the road as she drove by, searchers were focused on swampland and wooded area. All right, that tip came in. Somebody had seen something or what they thought was something. Yep. On the third day of the search, in the woods about a kilometer from where Shirley's car had been discovered, the soldiers stumbled across what would prove to be some valuable evidence. They discovered a white plastic bag with the Canadian Tire logo on it. From the book, Tears of the Cheetah by Stephen J. O'Brien, quote, Inside was a man's leather jacket and running shoes. Both were spattered with blood, by DNA tests matched that of Shirley Duguay, but no other person's DNA was found. In the lining of the jacket, they also found a whirl of long white hairs. But when the forensic lab in Halifax looked at these, Duff Evers, one of a dwindling breed of forensic specialists in hair identification, concluded that the hairs came from a cat and not from a human. What? End quote. 
When talking to Doug Beamish at his parents' place, RCMP had noted a white tomcat named Snowball living in the home. All right. It was now December. The searchers had been sent home and six weeks had gone by since anyone had last seen or heard from Shirley Duguay. So her five kids are just like... With their parents and friends and maybe the older two are with their father. Up to this point, there was no case that had ever been solved by animal DNA. But RCMP believed this might be the break that they needed. Yeah. Cops went to work trying to find a lab to test the hairs found in the jacket against Snowball's DNA. And the human labs had turned them away. A lot of them were just laughing at them. On the internet, cops found out about an American geneticist named Stephen J. O'Brien, later author of the book Tears of a Cheetah. As well as his genetic work on large cats in 1982, O'Brien and his colleagues published a gene map of the common domestic house cat in the magazine Science. Science! Science! This study was one of those that helped to create the scientific field of comparative genomics. Way over my head. (laughs) RCMP had run out of options, so they gave Dr. O'Brien a call. They explained the situation, noting they had a strong suspect in what they believed to be the murder of Shirley Duguay. They had no body, but they did have cat hair. That's so weird. In the jacket, why would pet hair and not the human's hair be there? I don't know. Maybe he was petting his cat before he left the house. (sighs) Speaking of cats. (laughs) Dr. O'Brien was excited about the prospect of helping solve the case in any way he could. O'Brien agreed to go ahead with the testing. After acquiring a search warrant, cops were off to the Beamish family home. The police had to chase Snowball around the house for 30 minutes until they finally got him under control. We know all about that. With the family looking on, Snowball was loaded into a cat carrier and taken to a veterinarian in nearby Summerside. Courageously able to find humor in the situation, Melvin Duguay, Shirley's father, told the TV show Forensic Files years later, quote, Investigator Robert Savoy told me he went down to the house and read out the cat's rights to the parents. <laughs> and I said, Roger, what did the cat say? And he said, meow. <laughs> End quote. So there you go. Thankfully, the father was able to find some humor in the situation. Exactly. And the cat helped. See the helpers. Snowball's blood and hair samples were carefully collected by the vet, Dr. Jane Bond, and placed into evidence bags, sealed, and taken away by the attending RCMP officers. To maintain the chain of custody with the evidence, on January 4th, 1995, three months after Shirley's disappearance, One of the attending RCMP officers flew with the samples in hand to personally give them to Dr. O'Brien and his team in the States. Wow. Yeah. Over the next few months, the DNA in Snowball's hair and blood were analyzed thoroughly and compared against those found on the lining of the jacket. They were a match. Excellent. Other samples of cat DNA from 19 other kitties in PEI were obtained as well, and compared against snowballs and the evidentiary hairs, just to give a control group, mm-hmm. obviously, because they didn't know at the time that nobody had ever done this, yep. whether or not cat DNA would match. And Snowball had some very interesting characteristics in his DNA that really made him stand out. In fact, out of a population of a few thousand cats on the island, the chances that any cat other than Snowball owned those hairs was 1 in 45 million. That is statistics and science. Right? A perfect twin or clone would have produced the same result, but cats do not give birth to genetic twins, and no cats had yet been cloned in a laboratory at the time. Snowball, the Beamish's cat, had provided the DNA that the cops needed. Hey, that is really cool. This solidified Douglas Leo Beamish as the number one suspect in Shirley Ann Duguay's disappearance and possible murder. On May 3rd, 1995, six months after Shirley had disappeared, a man on his way to do some trout fishing came across a pile of brush that looked strange. Oh, this is never good. When he moved some of the brush aside, he realized he'd discovered a corpse. 
Horrified at this find, he called police. The site was near North Enmore, and this is a 15-minute drive west from where Shirley's car had been found, which is actually a long way away in PEI. Yeah, that's true. And remote, very yeah. remote. Just like the psychic had told police, there was Shirley near water and pine trees in a shallow grave. Forensics teams found the brutally battered and partially decomposed body of a woman in the grave. Her hands were still tied behind her back. Oh, so sad. As the news broke, even before they had a positive ID, police arrested Douglas Leo Beamish and charged him with the first-degree murder of Shirley Duguay. They didn't want to give him a chance to bolt, and initial indicators were that it was Shirley Duguay who'd been found. The person was of small stature, like she was. Yeah, and tiny. There were some other factors that indicated it might be her. After all, there was not anyone else matching the description that the police were looking for in the area, and she wouldn't remain unidentified for long. Ten days later, dental records positively identified the body as that of Shirley Ann Duguay. The family could finally grieve, and the trial against Douglas Leo Beamish could proceed. He was held without bail. Good. Surprise. And now let's see what kind of... Just what he kind of tries to pull, I can only imagine. A posthumous forensic exam would indicate blunt force trauma as the most likely cause of death. Tiny Shirley's jaw was broken in three places, and her nose had been smashed, which would account for the large amount of blood in the car. The beating was so vicious that Shirley had aspirated one of her own teeth, which had settled in her lung. Ugh. Why? She was just so tiny, he didn't need to go to that extreme. Well, he was in a rage. Yeah. Before the trial began, a voir dire was held to determine whether the precedent-setting cat DNA evidence would be allowed, as well as some of the other stuff. Sorry, I have a question. Shoot. What is voir dire? What the, was that? It's like a... a voir dire. A, a voir dire? I've never heard that. A voir dire is just a fancy name for a preliminary hearing. Oh, so okay. It's legal jargon. Yeah. Okay. Essentially. So they're examining the evidence to see if it should be put into a trial in front of the jury. Got it. Okay. The results of the voir dire indicated that, yes, the Crown would be able to present the evidence at trial. Nice. From court documents, the way this would be admissible is if, quote, it can be made sufficiently clear to the jury that, one, the estimates are not intended to be precise, two, they are the products of mathematical and scientific theory, not concrete facts, three, they do not purport to define the likelihood of guilt, four, they should only be used to form a notion of the rarity of the genetic profile of the accused, and five, the DNA evidence must be considered, along with all the other evidence, in the case relating to the issue of identification, end quote. I understood all of that. You did. I did. Good. I'm Science hoping. Science and math. Exactly. Yeah. But there has to be other evidence present. Yeah, that can't be the only thing. That's right. Got it. So in other words, Snowball's DNA could be used as long as there were other substantiated pieces of evidence to support it. Like the Canada Tire bag with his jacket in it? Exactly. Got it. <laughs> There were other pieces of evidence pointing at Beamish as Shirley's killer. Beamish, however, decided to take his chances and pled not guilty. I just knew it. Of course. Yeah. During the nine-week trial, it came out that Doug Beamish's propensity for domestic violence was evident even before his relationship with Shirley Duguay. A former common-law spouse of Doug Beamish's came and testified that she'd been beaten badly about the face and head by Beamish in her Toronto home in the mid-1980s. Beamish was drinking with the woman and a friend. Their relationship was already struggling at the time due to Beamish's brutish behavior. The woman's children were in bed, asleep, in another room. As soon as the friend left, Beamish began demanding sex from the woman. When she refused him, Beamish flew into a rage. He picked up a large butcher knife in the kitchen and dragged the woman by her hair to her bedroom, where he proceeded to rape the woman, knife in hand. Oh my god. Nice fella. This guy's the worst. As she struggled and screamed, Beamish held the knife to the woman's throat and said that he was going to kill her that night. When Beamish had finished, he and the woman exited the bedroom, finding the woman's kids in the living room. Oh. 
These poor kids. Yeah. They had been awakened by the commotion and were clearly upset about what was going on with their mom. When the woman tried to comfort them, Beamish again grabbed her and slammed her to the floor and once again held the butcher knife to her throat, threatening her life a second time, this time in front of the kids. Uh, this guy. The petrified children were sitting on the couch, watching the whole thing unfold, unable to do anything to help. Beamish said he felt dirty and decided that he needed a bath at this point. What? He took the knife with him into the bathroom. From court documents, quote, The woman testified that while he was in the tub, he yelled for her to come into the bathroom. When she did, he grabbed her by the hair and pulled her down into the tub and bit her on the face. He told her not to bother trying to call for help because he had cut the phone wires. She checked and found the wires were in fact cut. End quote. And bit her on the face? Bit her on the face. I mean, everything else is awful too. And, uh, yeah. A family member of Beamish's was called on by the Crown to testify about a letter he'd seen Douglas Beamish present to Shirley in the summer of 1992. So, years after he has a bad relationship with somebody else, now he's in a bad relationship with Shirley Duguay. It's happening all over again. From court documents, quote, the letter itself was not introduced in evidence, but Nelson Beamish testified that he saw Douglas Beamish deliver the letter, that Shirley Duguay gave it to him so he could read it. According to Nelson's recollection, it stated the writer did not know why Shirley left him and that he wanted her to return and try to work things out. The writer went on to say if they could not be together, there was no point in living and he was going to kill himself, Shirley, and their three children. Nelson said that the letter was signed D. Beamish and that the signature appeared to have been written in blood, although the letter itself was in ink, end quote. And Beamish's defense attacked this witness in cross-examination, asking him if the letter could have been signed in something other than blood, but which the witness had to concede because he's not a blood expert, but the damage had already been done. And I feel like the defense kind of missed the whole point, the right. content of the letter versus it, what it was written in. Yeah. Um, it could yeah. have been signed in poop for all, all anybody knows. It doesn't have to be signed in anything but pen. It's still disturbing and horrible. Exactly. It's this like uh, the Saddam Hussein defense from South Park. Don't look over here. Look over there. Yes, just ignore that. Ignore the content. Ignore the fact that he said he was going to kill himself, Shirley, and their three children. It's I, so frustrating. I, I don't know. Sometimes legal stuff is just madness. Yes, the Crown also asked a forensic podiatrist to check whether the shoes that had been found in the Canadian tire bag matched Beamish. He happened to wear a size 9 also, as were the shoes. After obtaining a search warrant, plaster casts were made of Beamish's feet. The podiatrist testified that the wear patterns on the inside and outside of the sneakers matched Doug Beamish's feet to a T and the wear patterns matched how he would have walked. So I happen to know someone that's a cop, and uh, her comment about criminals, they're usually not that smart. I think he falls in that category. Well, he did he try to... He just handed to them in a bag. Well, he didn't bury it. He just sort of threw it away. PEI is a very small place, so yeah, I guess you're right. He did kind of hand it to them. They yeah. had to look first. They had to look for a bag where his jacket, his shoes, and his cat's hair were all in there for them, all wrapped in a package. Right. Beamish's denials of the ownership of the leather jacket that had been found soaked with Shirley's blood and containing Snowball's fur fell flat. Police obtained a photo of Beamish wearing an identical jacket taken 24 hours before Shirley went missing. That's incredible. I didn't have that jacket. That jacket that you found isn't the one that I had on. And look, 24 hours before I was holding my cat wearing this same jacket. Yeah. A jailhouse informant came forward... He actually wasn't holding the cat. <laughs> no, I'm just saying <laughs> that would have been a better photo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a, just handing it to the jury. Sure. A jailhouse informant also came forward stating that Beamish had admitted to killing Shirley to him. Even though jailhouse confessions are suspect, given the amount of detail that the informant had, he testified for the Crown against Beamish. That's incredible. 
Even some of Beamish's out-of-court statements to a news organization and his own family members came back to haunt him. All right. All this and more taken together with the evidence that was given to the court by Dr. Stephen J. O'Brien in regard to Snowball's DNA being on the jacket found with Shirley Duguay's blood all over it are the things that ultimately sank Douglas Beamish. Yay. Thanks, Kitty. Beamish's trial attorney, in what seemed to be a Johnny Cochran moment, emotionally told the court, without the cat, the case falls flat. Ugh. That's just... <sighs> Isn't that stupid? Yeah. And... <laughs> well, well, what about the blood and the shoes and the jacket and the... And him in the photo, and the fact his whole history has just been violence and he loves hitting people in the face. Exactly. The jury obviously didn't see things the same way that Beamish's attorneys did. They found him guilty of murder in the second degree. Hooray! Although he'd been charged with murder in the first degree, too much time had passed between the writing of the apparently blood-signed letter of murderous intent for the jury to feel comfortable finding Beamish guilty of first-degree murder. I guess that's one of those legal things where they're like, we know we can really get him on the second, so let's just get him with the second. But we all know deep down it was first. Yeah. In legal and forensic circles, it was a huge win. This was the first time ever that animal DNA had con convicted anyone of murder. Awesome. There was finally an iota of justice for Shirley Duguay. Although all five of her children were left motherless, and the three youngest were left without a father as well. It was justice in the eyes of the law. Yep. Douglas Leo Beamish was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years for the murder of Shirley Duguay in July of 1996. Of course, Beamish appealed, maintaining his innocence the entire time, but lost both appeals. Got it. The appeal court actually did agree that the testimony from the previous common law spouse was prejudicial, but it wasn't enough to warrant a new trial or to overturn Beamish's conviction. In 2013, Douglas Beamish was up for parole. Oh. Still denying his guilt... Beamish's application for parole was denied. Perfect. From The Guardian, a PEI newspaper, quote, In its report, the parole board said Beamish was deemed to have a medium level of motivation and low reintegration potential. The board said his conduct in prison appeared satisfactory, but was described as demanding and confrontational with the negative view toward the justice system. Although he didn't have a history of institutional violence, the board had noted he had numerous charges for disobeying the rules and had seven disciplinary convictions in prison. Those included ten refusals to give urine samples. How tough is he going to be in jail? Like, he beat up someone, killed someone that was, like, under 100 pounds. Yeah. Like, he's not going to be tough in jail. I like that he got it satisfactory. He got a C for showing up to jail. Yeah, there you exactly. Go. Beamish had two suspensions from the prison's education center, and in May, he made inappropriate comments to a female correction officer. End quote. Shocking. Probably using Don't even sexist say it. language. Exactly. Yeah. Not surprising. Not surprising. A few other factors were at play as well. Beamish had been uncooperative with his case management team behind bars, and a psych assessment given to him the year prior said he represented a low to moderate risk for violence toward the general public, but was an elevated risk to intimate partners. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that leopard did not change his spots. Yearly, in December, islanders are reminded of Shirley's case and others who were murdered by domestic partners. The PEI Advisory Council on the Status of Women hosts an annual memorial service to mark Canada's National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, and they do it in December around the same time as the anniversary of what happened uh, at the Ecole Technique. The so around the 12th, I think, yeah. the 6th to the 12th? Yes, I believe yeah. it's around then. Mm -hmm. Around the venue they have, red painted wooden silhouettes, each with a plaque, commemorate a number of the women murdered in the province over the years, and they stand as what they call silent witnesses. There is one for Shirley Duguay. One slogan they used in 2017 implores action. Don't stand by, stand with. Everyone has a part to play in ending violence against women. Yeah. 
One article I read is that Shirley's daughter, Shelley, has become active in victim services. Good on you, Shelley. Yeah, Shelley. There have been jokes about this trial made over the years due to the cat evidence, and they're not all in poor taste, actually. My favorite being that Douglas Leo Beamish didn't have a snowball's chance in getting away with Shirley's murder. Is it okay to laugh? Yes, that's the point. I know, it's a joke, but still. I'm hoping that Melvin Duguay, Shirley's dad, who also showed a sense of humor about the case, might be laughing somewhere now. He passed away in 2005. He did mention it before, so I'm sure he understands. Yeah, I'm sure he got it. Like he yeah. said, what did the cat say? Meow. Meow. <laughs> Meow. 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 That's it for this week's case. <sighs> the murder of Shirley Ann Duguay. Any thoughts on this one, Carol? Yes, a few things. So um, I think it's that uh, kind of thing about the cycle continuing mm-hmm. and on the outside kind of seeing how did this happen again. Yes. But I think that in this situation, people like this guy, they're very charming and Mm -hmm. have their good points too and kind of convince, maybe manipulate the other person who's really hoping that things would be different. I'm sure he was blaming her for everything that went on. His other past, his past failed relationships, all those things. It's just, it's not cut and dry. I'm just kind of finding that more and more. He didn't just get away with things. He was constantly manipulating and weaseling and using his charming ways to kind of get her back. And then it's just brutal. Yeah. He was doing all that stuff like threatening to kill himself if he couldn't be with her. And and then ultimately he's saying that he's going to kill her too and their kids. So she was terrified. Uh I would I would say of this man kind of feel like he'd do that thing where he'd get really upset after and I didn't mean it and I feel terrible and I'm not a bad person that kind of stuff that try to convince the the other person be like no he couldn't mean it who could really mean something like that and, and I guess what I'm seeing is some people really mean it and maybe in his mind like we know some some people we know they really do want to change at the time. Maybe he really did want to change. Maybe he knew what he was doing was wrong. Yeah, he you didn't know? know another way out of it. Yeah, and he's caught He's caught in the cycle just as much as she is, and I'm not making an excuse for no. him because there are options for, the, for somebody who is abusive to somebody. They can go get help. Yes. I know I had anger problems, and I had to get help. There are ways to get help, and it's difficult and uncomfortable. That's right. And... Yeah, and he has opportunities, I think, in jail to kind of help with that, and he did not use them, clearly. No, he didn't avail himself of any of that. This guy is never going to get better until he's able to actually really admit to himself that it was him who caused this. Not surely. It was his anger and his violence. So there you go. So that's it. Is he up for parole? How often does that guy get to go up for parole? Well, like I say, he was up for parole in 2013, and he didn't get out at the time. Yeah. So he'll probably up be, he's probably been up for parole since, but I didn't see anything in the news. Yeah. Uh, it's apparently like every two years. So. Yep. It's just a matter of time before he gets into that groove of, this is the next hoop I have to jump through so I can fool these people into giving me parole. Because that's what we see over and over and over again. Finally, they kind of figure it out. And they're paroled because, oh, okay, I jumped through all those hoops, even though I didn't really change anything. I just said the words that you want me to say. Yes, I did it. You know, we've seen it over and over. Let's just hope he's not a hoop jumper. Let's hope he's not a hoop jumper. Still be difficult in jail, and they'll be just like, no, no reason to let you out. Exactly. All right. Before we go, we want to say thank you to our patrons. 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 <laughs> patrons. Providing patronage. April Phelps from Asterville, Ontario. April, thank you. Another April. April, yes. April. April showers. Betty Holbrook from Freedom, Wyoming. Freedom, Wyoming? Yeah. Oh, my God. From it sounds Freedom, like a great Wyoming. place. And... It looks like uh, the Minds of Madness podcast, a.k.a. Tyler and Beck, have raised their their patronage uh, to uh, another level. So wow. thanks, guys. 
Guys, thank you. Much appreciated. Enjoy that. And I really enjoy your Minds of Madness uh, food page there on the Facebook. Oh, I'm always yeah. seeing good things and there. Carol has something to say to Tyler about the uh, air fryer. Um, Apparently, this was your suggestion to Mike to get an air fryer. Yes. Best suggestion ever. We've made such good food. And the whole house isn't all hot because it's in a tiny air fryer. There you go. It's awesome. Anastasia Martins Anastasia. from Anastasia. Surrey. British Sorry, Columbia. just down the street. Hey, neighbor. Just down the street. It is literally just down the street, but I'm not telling you where. Don't say the address out No, I would never do that. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. <laughs> Tamara Bishop from, oh my God. Wow. Gananoke? Gananoke. Oh. Gananoke, Ontario. From Gananoke, Ontario. Okay. Tamara Bishop. Look at that. She plays chess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone just named Jennifer. Jennifer. Jen Jen. She came in at the $5 pledge place but she did not give her name or address so if you want stickers jennifer. or something go back jennifer and edit that or just uh, message we'll send me. you a sticker jennifer. we'll send you stickers for sure because you you've earned them unless you don't want them which is cool that's, that's cool too not everybody wants stickers so jennifer what do you think jennifer's last name is because she's just saying jennifer her name is jennifer benifer <laughs> is it aniston is it jennifer aniston? jennifer aniston Oh, wow. for sure. She She's, would want stickers, so though. Brad Brad Pitt's ex-wife before Angelina Jolie. Yeah, that's all sad. Yeah, we're sorry, Jennifer. Jennifer Ben Affleck. He, oh, it's, oh, maybe it's Benifer. Ben Affleck's wife. Could I be. think they also broke up. Oops. This has all gone sideways. Sorry, Jennifer, if you want stickers, you know what to do. We'll should, send them to you. You do. Uh, Libby Green. I like that name, Libby. From Glasgow. <gasps> Lancashire. Great Britain. Yeah. Great Britain or Great Britain, as it's properly pronounced. GB. It's from the GBs. Robin Gill. She's some, from somewhere in Canada because her, her uh, email address is a .ca. So Robin Gill. She hmm. comes from a long line of fishermen. A long line of fishermen. Or... She could be a fish. She's the fish? She's like a mermaid. She, oh, Robin, Robin Gill, Gill the mermaid. Where's the mermaid from Atlantis? At <laughs> She's the mermaid from Atlantis. Yay, Robin Gill. Thank you. You are our first mermaid. Oh, thank you, mermaids. Of, you are the first personage of the mermaid persuasion. I have questions for you. Yes, please email us so we can talk to you about your mer mermaid ship. Exactly. I want to meet your friends. I want to meet you and your friends. Can we have a mermaid meetup? Kimberly Price from Glen Carbon, Illinois. Glen Carbon, Illinois. Yes. Thank you, Kimberly. Kimberly. Della Gordon. Oh, nope. Somebody else who lessened their pledge. <laughs> <laughs> Alan McLean. Alan. That's a good Canadian name. It Alan is Alan McLean. He should be. He should be a goalie. Alan McLean, are you a goalie? Are you a goalie or defense? I don't know. I feel like I can see you with some nice hockey hair. Where does he, Where? who does he play for? We need to be careful here because... Well, you know what we can't say. What? Well, can we do like a junior team maybe? maybe? Maybe he's young. Maybe he's only 16 or 17. Maybe he plays for the Halifax Mooseheads. There you go. He's the goalie for the Halifax Mooseheads. He's Alan Mooseheads. McLean. <laughs> Alan McLean. And Ashley Y. Why, Ashley? Why? Exactly. I want to know, Ashley, Ashley. Why? Ashley, I have questions. Why? Why? From Mississauga. From Mississauga, That's Ontario. where the airport is. Ontario, yes. And what an airport it is. What an airport that and is. And what a huge highway it is out from the airport. Yes. I I actually quite like the drive there, which is kind of weird, but... Toronto, I feel, is like the big boy city or the big person city. It's, we live in like a little city. Toronto is We live is in the kitty city. city. We do. It's just like, come on, we're cute. Halifax is the teeny tiny city. Oh, Halifax is sweet. It's oldie time. Yeah, exactly. Vancouver, it's a kitty city. Uh, Toronto is like, uh, this is like the big city. Yes. Of Canada. Yes. C. Valiquet sent C? us some money uh, via PayPal. All right. Uh, yes, only C. The letter C is the first yeah. name. And she's from Ontario. But she said, this is not donut money. It's beer money for your trip to New Orleans. Well. How about beignet money? Can we, can you do that? Yeah, because I can't drink. Here's yeah. the thing. So 
I, I'm, I'll give the if Scott wants to drink it up, then he can have the beer money. So, or yeah, Mike can buy money. me yarn from. Or, or you <laughs> know what I'll shelf. do? I will buy people beer in the French Quarter. There you go. I think that's fair. My advice: don't go for the three dollar, six beer dollar beer beers in the French Quarter. That watery swill will just make you piss. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Spend six dollars for one local beer when you refuse the three. For six deal, the bartender will look at you like you have two heads. Just tell them you're Canadian. <laughs> see, her oh, name is Kara. Kara Vil- Viliket. Okay, that. there you go. That helps. I do not work in the manufacturing of <laughs> braces or bridges. <laughs> what? She's from Aww. Brace Bridge. Brace Ontario. Bridge. There you go. Kara, thank you're you. The best. Thank you very much. Mike will buy beers for others. I will buy beers for others. Can I? Because if I buy them for myself, I will just disappear. Uh, yeah, that won't go it well. It would not be good. No. That would be a very, very bad thing. But New Orleans is going to be amazing. Exactly. And Monet Terrio sent us some donut money as well. Monet. Thank you, Monet. Monet. Monet Terrio. Where's Monet from? Well, I don't know because I don't think she left us a a thing. But I hope uh, she is not related to Rock Terrio. I hope so, too. That guy was horrible. Horrible. But yeah. if you're related, we know that, you know what? Yep. We like you just how you are, Monet. <laughs> Thank you for the Monet, Monet. <laughs> Thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. We really do. It's so great. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. Or for a one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal, at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a like or follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. We just passed 5,000 likes on our Facebook page. What? Which is awesome. That is awesome. a lot of likes. It is. I was pretty impressed. And I I saw that we were like 16 or 26 away the other day. And I went into the Yumber Yard, which is our one of our groups that I'm just about to mention. And... I said, please, if you haven't given the page a like, then please do it. Please. And they did. And it was like within five minutes, boom, we were over 5,000. You guys are awesome. They are awesome. You got thumbs ups all over. Uh, as, as we mentioned, our closed Facebook groups, uh, the Yumber Yard, the Barn Yard, and the, <laughs> the Craft Barn. The Craft Barn. Uh, are all kind of fun places to hang. come hang out with uh, Carol, myself, Scott. Joanna. Joanna, she's in there, man. And other cool, good eggs from the dark people we met. community. Yeah, yeah. So from yeah, Calgary, they, from Victoria. There's people from all over. There's even there people, are. someone from there Ice, are. Iceland. Um, I saw someone walking their dog today in Denmark. Exactly. It's so cool in there. I love yeah, it. We international. Have, we have a great time. Yeah. Speaking of international, we have a promo this weekend. It's from Sinead at the Mensria podcast. Mens rea is the legal principle of criminal intent. It means literally the guilty mind. Join me, Sinead, every fortnight to discuss Ireland and the UK's most heinous crimes and the court cases that followed. Do you want to know more about a kink killing in Dublin in 2012? Or serial killers in Scotland? Whatever your guilty pleasure, you'll find it and all the details with me. Find Mens Rea wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Sinead. That's Mens Rea, spelled M-E-N-S-R-E-A. We'll share a link in our show notes. So there you go. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. All right. See you next time. Chowder peoples. Peace. Peace out.